and they describe themselves as uh, drinkers with a running problem. Well, I think this group is uh, uh, wine drinkers with an archaeology problem, clearly. Uh, well, I'm really honored to be the first uh, guinea pig for this new uh, format, but it, it sounded really intriguing when Doug uh, asked me to, to come talk. So uh, I said, oh, what the heck? Of course, you know, when things are months away, it's easy to agree to them. And then when it gets closer and closer, you start realizing what you've gotten yourself into. But no, I'm happy to talk about uh, a subject that's really interesting to me. I hope it's interesting to you. Uh, there have been uh, some very um, uh, interesting and uh, transforming archaeological finds in the Tucson area in the last 15 years. And uh, I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the, the prehistoric Ho'okam culture, but the discoveries I'm talking about have to do with a, a much earlier culture that uh, developed and flourished in the river valleys of southern Arizona and northern Sonora uh, long before the whole come. And in fact, we don't understand if there's a direct cultural connection between this earlier culture and the whole come culture. And uh, because these discoveries are so recent, uh, I, I'm sorry to say we don't have a name for this earlier culture yet. So maybe if you've got a suggestion, you should uh, tell me tonight. Um, and what I'm talking about are the first uh, farming villages in this part of the world. And uh, they were quite early here. And they uh, developed a, 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 very, uh, a very interesting uh, level of organization that uh, enabled them to build uh, some, some pretty impressive canal systems. And these are the earliest canals that have been found in North America, right here in Tucson. And I'm going to concentrate my talk about discoveries uh, in the Santa Cruz River floodplain in the last 15 years. Uh, but this culture it, it was wider than that. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that it, it, it included the other, the other river valleys of uh, southern Arizona and, and northern Sonora. Well, what was, what was uh, very different about this new uh, adaptation, this new culture in these river valleys, uh, was that they, uh, for, for thousands of years, people had figured out to make, how to make a living in the Sonoran Desert and the desert grasslands by being foragers. And then they figured out how to do it by being farmers. And in the uh, past several decades, there have been different ideas about how agriculture arrived in this part of the world. And one of the early ideas uh, was uh, put forth by uh, the well-known archaeologist Emil Howery. And he believed that the earliest agriculture in the southwestern United States uh, spread through the highlands, up, up the spine of the Sierra Madre and into the Mogollon Highlands, and from there it spread uh, uh, to the other parts of the southwest. <clears throat> well, then during the 1980s, uh, there were a couple of things that happened in, in archaeology. One of them was that the technique of radiocarbon dating advanced significantly. And for the first time, archaeologists were able to obtain radiocarbon dates directly on charred maize remains from archaeological sites, very small amounts of charred maize remains. Before that, they had to uh, date large uh, lumps of charcoal, or if they had, let's say, uh, a corn cobs, they had to pool together several corn cobs to have enough to, to radiocarbon date. But in the 1980s, there was a new technique of radiocarbon dating that was developed that allowed uh, direct dating of organic material as small as, as, as a single grain of rice or, or, or a, a tip of a match head. And that really changed, uh, that really revolutionized uh, the information that we were able to get from these early farming village sites. And it pushed back 
the arrival of <clears throat> Mesoamerican agriculture farther and farther back in time. So it went from being <clears throat> sometime in the, uh, around uh, the transition from BC to AD, about 2,000 years ago, to now we have directly dated maize remains in Tucson that go back 4,100 years, more than 4,000 years. And uh, not just maize, we have uh, uh, direct dates on squash seeds from a cave in southeastern Arizona that are also 4,000 years old, a McEwen Cave, if you're familiar with that site. And then at some other sites in uh, southern Arizona, mostly in the, in the Tucson area, there's direct dates on, um, oh, I'm sorry, there, there's uh, evidence like uh, tobacco seeds that are uh, 3,200 years old. Uh, that's the earliest evidence of tobacco smoking in North America, right here in Tucson. We have, uh, yeah, <laughs> and it was a stronger kind of tobacco than what we smoke today. Let me tell you, uh, uh, a, a paleobotanist explained it to me this way. She said, the kind of tobacco we smoke today is about 4% nicotine. Well, the kind of tobacco these people were smoking 3,200 years ago was about 40% nicotine. <clears throat> So it'd be, it'd be cheaper to get your fix that way. But, uh, um, but they, uh, there's also very interesting evidence of cotton pollen at early farming village sites in the Tucson area that go back 3,200 years ago. And there is a wild cotton that grows in the canyons around here, but it's at a higher elevation than the floodplain where the, these uh, pollen remains were found. And so it's a big question, was this domesticated cotton that had spread from the south that early? Or was this the wild cotton? But the wild cotton that grows locally, not only does it grow at higher elevations, uh, but it requires moisture. Uh, it require, it, it, if they were growing it in the, in the floodplain, they would have had to irrigate it. And also, it doesn't have fiber. So if it was the, the local wild cotton, then um, they were not cultivating it or collecting it for uh, fiber, for textiles. Uh, they were, were doing it to eat. The, the cotton seeds are, are very uh, nutritious. But anyway, so there's a variety of uh, cultigens that we can recognize in the archaeological record now that go way back in time, right here in the Tucson area. And there's also very tantalizing evidence that the foragers that were living here before these Mesoamerican cultigens arrived were intensively exploiting the, these, these damp floodplain environments and were intensively collecting wild plant foods and probably protecting them and encouraging them and possibly even cultivating them. So, we may be fooling ourselves to think that agriculture, that, that, that people were not doing, uh, uh, were not cultivating plants until they had these tropical cultigens. Uh, it's looking increasingly uh, likely that these local foragers uh, were very in tune with their environments and were intensively uh, using, collecting, manipulating uh, wild plant foods of the Sonoran Desert and the desert grasslands before that. Well, what, what happened after uh, these Mesoamerican cultigens arrived, like especially maize, maize w was much more productive than any of the local wild plant foods, and we see a sudden increase in the number of uh, archaeological sites in these damp alluvial settings like floodplains and alluvial fans but we also see an increase in their size. We see that they're, they're uh, building pit houses for the first time. We're seeing pit house villages for the first time. And uh, some, some of the most shocking uh, 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 recognitions by archeologists in the last 15 years is uh, some of these sites are quite large. Uh, one of the first sites that was excavated, if you know where the uh, I-10 Miracle Mile interchange is, and the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory at that, uh, just west of that interchange, 
1993, archaeologists from Desert Archaeology uncovered uh, a, an early farming pit house settlement that had several hundred pit houses in it. The name of that site is the Santa Cruz Bend site. And uh, over the years, since that discovery, uh, more and more work in the floodplain because of all the construction work related to I-10 improvements and also uh, the city of Tucson's uh, downtown redevelopment uh, project, the Rio Nuevo project. And uh, these, the archeological work that was conducted uh, because of these large-scale construction projects in the floodplain uncovered more and more of these early farming village sites. So now uh, we are, have a, a better picture, and among the amazing things is uh, that these were canal builders from very early on. Uh, they, the oldest canal that we have found dates to 3,500 years ago. And these canals in Tucson are larger and more, com more complex than the earliest canals we know about in Mexico. And I, what I mean by more complex is the canals here were built to divert uh, surface flow from the Santa Cruz River to these irrigated fields. And the earliest known canals in Mexico that are about the same age, actually the oldest canals are about 3,000 years old, and we have some here that are 3,500 years old. Um, the earliest canals in Mexico were smaller, and they were designed to divert surface runoff only during rain events. So the canals here look, uh, on the face of it, on, on, on the information we have right now, uh, were developed independently and were not some Mesoamerican technology that was introduced to this region. So the, the early farmers here, uh, it looks like they came up with it on their own. And what we've seen at these uh, multiple sites that have been investigated is they were building canals in a lot of places along the Santa Cruz River. And they were getting better at it over time. They were building bigger, bigger and bigger canals and better design canals. And they were operating them uh, more efficiently over time. Uh, there's evidence in, canal, in these canal sediments that uh, points to the operation of head gates on these canals as long ago as, as 3,000 years ago. So this early farming village culture uh, was also uh, not only the first canal builders of the Southwest, the first villagers of the Southwest in my mind, uh, but also they were the first pottery makers. We have evidence of pottery right at the base of A Mountain uh, that goes back uh, 4,100 years ago. And uh, I've talked to some Southwest archeologists about this and described this kind of pottery to them. It's, these are small pots. These were not utilitarian vessels for cooking or, or storage. They were, they were very small cups and bowls, but they were fired ceramics decorated with incised designs on the rims and the exteriors. So they were fired ceramic small vessels uh, used for some non-utilitarian purpose. Of course, when archaeologists can't figure out some obvious purpose, they say ritual, right? <laughs> well, maybe so. But these early farming villagers were the first canal builders, the first villagers, the first pottery makers, and the first long-distance traders. Uh, we find evidence that they were trading. They had long-distance trade connections for uh, materials like obsidian and seashells for jewelry and rare and non-local minerals and stone materials that they made very special uh, objects out of. So I had a whole spiel about you know, the implications of all this. I, to me, the, the really interesting implications are in terms of social organization. And I'm just going to wind up and open it up to questions after I give you a, a very short spiel about that. I think that there's uh, evidence at multiple sites of this time that the largest uh, of these early farming villages 
had multiple households that were cooperating to build and operate these canals and were functioning as irrigation communities. And so these larger canal systems uh, with secondary canals coming off of primary canals uh, represent a larger level of effort than a single family could construct and operate and maintain. So to me, it represents a level of integration, social integration, social organization above the level of the household for the first time in this part of the Southwest. And it was very precocious for the Southwest. Um, we don't see this level of development until several centuries later in other parts of the Southwest. And that level of uh, corporate organization is very interesting to me. Uh, we also see signs, I think, that the nuclear family household ha became the primary unit of social and economic organization. I think there's clear archaeological signs of a shift from uh, sharing of food with the entire group to restricted sharing to just your household, we see these food storage pits move from outside of the houses to inside of the houses, examples like that. And I think there's also signs that the lineage, the family lineage, uh, became uh, important for the first time. So these households held property, uh, I think, for the first time. Uh, when uh, you look at cross-cultural data around the world, uh, small communities operating small-scale irrigation systems like these, you see that the water source and the primary canals that are delivering the water to the fields are held as common property by the whole community, the whole irrigation community. Every farmer in that community has a right to that water, has a right to use that canal. But in, across the world, in these types of irrigation communities, the the fields that are irrigated and the produce from those fields are private property, invariably. That's very interesting. What the implication is when they were building canal systems like this to, uh, and operating as these irrigation communities, they were developing more complex concepts of property than had ever existed before in this part of the world and uh, including the, the first concepts of private property that could be passed down from generation to generation within your family lineage. So uh, I see signs of that, uh, and I can talk about that if you want to talk about that. Uh, and among them are uh, uh, signs of ancestor veneration, which is a way of reinforcing your lineage uh, claims to uh, private property and also to uh, your lineage's uh, right to a claim for, to that water source. So I could go on, but I'm going to stop and hopefully this will generate some questions and some discussion. Okay, do we have any questions? Here, come on up. Have you had uh, any relation of this group with other groups in the region or in some parts in southern USA? The question is, uh, do archaeologists see signs of cultural connections with other parts, uh, with other regions, other cultures? And yes, we're starting to see what we think are signs of connections. Um, you may have heard of the basket maker culture on the Colorado Plateau. Well, we see artifact styles at these early farming villages here that look for all the world like basket maker style artifacts. If you found these, these uh, dart point styles up on the Colorado Plateau, these bone dice, uh, these... Um, uh, types of uh, other types of bone tools. If you found those up on the Colorado Plateau, you would say, wow, that's basket maker too. Also, the burial practices down here look very much like the basket maker too pattern on the Colorado Plateau. We also see uh, 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 styles of artifacts that resemble those in Calif Southern California. 
And we also see styles of artifacts, of course, that go uh, that down into Mexico. So does that answer your question? Thank you. How, do you address, how did they address the fertility of the soil continually farming? Well, they didn't have to worry about, uh, the question is, how did they uh, deal with the uh, fertility of the soil, uh, avoid uh, depleting the fertility of the soil? And if they were irrigators, how did they avoid uh, salinization, which has been a problem around the world for irrigators? Well. They were uh, farming and irrigating in an active floodplain. And what I mean by that is uh, every year uh, there would be a flood that would deposit fresh silt on the floodplain surface or in, on the alluvial fan surface and uh, would flush out the salts and deposit fresh fertile sediments for agriculture. So it was a naturally sustainable replenishing system. Question back here. Hi, I was wondering if you see sort of any March changes related to social stratification in the burials that you've excavated. I think everybody heard that question. Um, so far, the question was, is there any sign of social stratification in the burials that have been found? There's been several hundred burials, uh, if you add them all up, that have been found at these sites in southern Arizona and Sonora. And there's really no signs of social stratification. Uh, it looks mostly uh, some gender differences in the grave offerings. Um, these are inhumations rather than cremations. In other words, they would fold the body up uh, in a sitting position or on its side or on its back. Um, I've even seen a couple that were head first. But uh, um, these were, uh, they would fold up the bodies and bury them in small pits. Sometimes they would reuse storage pits for graves. But the grave offerings that uh, we can see at these open air sites, of course we can't see all the perishable material culture, the clothing and basketry and all that stuff that, that are preserved in dry caves. But at the burials that we see and, and the, the, the artifacts in those burials, it looks like it was an egalitarian culture. And uh, archaeologists think that during the Neolithic period around the world, and that's what, really what we're talking about here, we're talking about the Neolithic transition in this part of the world. Archaeologists have found that burial practices really reflect uh, egalitarian societies around the world. Later during the Neolithic, in different parts of the world, uh, social stratification did develop. But we don't see it here until much later, if, we, if at all. Okay, we'll take one more question and then we're going to take a short break and let the wait staff get caught up. And before they disappear, um, I'd like to just give a note of thanks to our wait staff. They've really been, been busted it out. Pardon? Okay. Why don't you go ahead and repeat The question was what are the gender differences in the burials? And. Uh, the patterning is not, is not probably st statistically significant, but we can see that fired ceramic figurine fragments and bone